Well, a very good morning to you all. Let me open our time this morning with a few lines from the end of Habakkuk. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones, and my legs tremble beneath me. Habakkuk comes to the end of this little book. He's presented two complaints to God. He's res- God's responded twice. And then this is Habakkuk's reaction. His body, his lips, <clears throat> his bones, his legs, they all start trembling. You talk about butterflies in your stomach. His head, shoulders, knees, and toes were shaking. And they can't stop. Isn't that an intriguing way for someone to respond to God? And doesn't that make you curious what was said? You bet it does. And God willing, we're going to look at exactly that this morning. But if I could just step back for a minute and briefly give a bit of overview, a framework for where we're heading this morning, I think it may help our time together. First, I must bring greetings from a number of brothers and sisters through southern Africa, particularly the church in Zambia, that peanut-shaped country in southern Africa, Malawi, not to be confused with Maui, and Mozambique. Brothers and sisters throughout those regions have said, please send our greetings back to your church back home. So I bring greetings from them, from others at Frontline Fellowship, the ministry I've been serving with. And even yesterday, the director, Dr. Hammond, asked me, please pass a warm greetings on to the body at home church. So greetings in Christ. About a year ago, I had the joy of worshiping with you just on the other side of that wall and was commissioned by you after the service to take the word of God to Africa to visit several different communities throughout, especially southern Africa, to understand better their communities and to hold out God's Word to them, to encourage them in Christ. And by God's grace, He's opened a number of doors to do just that, answering prayers that we have brought before Him time and time again, and working so graciously in spite of us to provide in many ways that we didn't bring before Him. He's faithful and gracious, generous to His children. So thank you, truly thank you for your prayer support, for battling on this side in prayer for our team and for the work in Africa. That's where the battle's won in the heart, says God in His Spirit opens and moves as we recognize our complete neediness of Him. There's been many ups and downs, physically, emotionally, spiritually, through this season. Perhaps not unlike some of the things that God's brought you through recently. It seems for a lot of people this last couple of years has been a whirlwind of things that have been very difficult to understand, trial after trial in many different ways. Our situations... And our feelings have changed drastically for many of us. But God, but God has not changed. He never will. He's totally in control of it all. And we still have a reason to hope in Him. It's the same hope of your parents and your grandparents' generation. It's the same hope of the apostles and the early church. And it's the same hope of the prophets. Of Habakkuk, for instance. In many of the places that we visited this last year, even though most of them were quite removed villages out in the sticks, so to speak, we got to walk together with different congregations and different collections of people, right through the book of Habakkuk together. 
It was one of two main focuses through this time. The first being Bible study, and where they didn't have Bibles, to distribute Bibles to people that memorized a chunk of Scripture. There was an eagerness for the Word. And secondly, worldview analysis, the way that we think about the world and the way that we apply the Bible to our lives, to our communities. But simply spending time in the Bible together is so worthwhile. The more attention that we give it, the more familiar we become with its story and prayer that God would change our hearts and open our ears to it. The more we see of God, who remember doesn't change. The more we understand of His will, which by the way, He has not hidden from us. He says He makes it very clear to us what is His will. So that's exactly what we're going to do together right now in the book of Habakkuk, a book that we got to spend a whole day in in some villages. One village that we visited in northwest Zambia, uh, perhaps the most remote of the places that we went to, we were told that a stretch of road to get there was about four hours. As we entered the turn to get to that road, we asked the man, how good is the road? And he said, oh, it is very bad. (laughs) And those 40 miles took 12 hours to get there, about walking speed. But in that village, at the end of the road, there was a group of people who had not had the Bible for 30 years brought to them. Since it had been translated into their local language 30 years ago and was distributed then, they hadn't received one Bible since that time. Lest you forget what a privilege it is that God has given to you to have His very Word translated into the English language some 630 years ago. We don't even have to go through a translator this morning so we can make a little more speed. So long as you can understand me. I do apologize. I have been known to have a rather incurable case of multiple pronunciations disorder. So if I do change things, bear with me. Let's commit this time to the Lord then as we go to His Word. Father, may You increase. May I decrease. That we would worship You more rightly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you aren't already there and you have your Bibles with you, I'm glad to see a few Bibles there. Would you open up to the book of Habakkuk? It will be of a big help if you can track along with some of this book. Where's Habakkuk? Well, if you have a physical Bible, go to Matthew and just flip back 20 or 30 pages. He's in one of those 12 minor prophets right at the end of the Old Testament. (laughs) It's one of those four-digit page numbers, I think. Now, the reason that they're called the minor prophets has nothing to do with their importance. It's simply because of their length. They're shorter than the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And we don't tend to give the minor prophets a lot of attention, but they're kind of a big deal. So who is Habakkuk? Well, he's a prophet. That's all we get. And that comes from verse 1, if you look. The oracle or the burden that Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. That's it. From what we have in the rest of the book, we can get a rough idea of when he lived. It was right around the time of when Babylon, aka the Chaldeans, depending on your translation, were coming onto the scene, and not in a good way. The northern kingdom of Israel had been persistent in sin and had been carried away into captivity by Assyria in the north. But in the south, does Judah pay attention? Do they get the memo? No, they choose not to. They can just carry on doing as they were doing. They love their sin. They don't feel like listening to God, so they don't let Israel's misfortunes get them down. And when it does look like they're in trouble, instead of turning to God, instead of repenting and coming to Him, they turn down to Egypt and others for help. Their military, their gods. Enter Habakkuk. He would have been a rough contemporary of Jeremiah. 
and ministered somewhere around the beginning of Daniel's and Ezekiel's ministries. Right? These are the concerns that he's dealing with. Just after Josiah's death, remember Josiah, who was living in rampant wickedness, the people had chucked God's law, and then one day the scroll of the law is found, and he reads it and tears his clothes and recognizes how far gone they are and repents. But God says, no, destruction is coming. Babylon will still come and take Judah away. But you won't see that because you have repented, because your heart has come after me. Josiah reforms the land, and then he dies in battle before that cap- captivity. As he was trying to stop Egypt in the south from coming up through the land. And Egypt puts one of Josiah's sons on the throne as sort of a puppet king to do what Egypt wants and to carry on as things used to be. The moral clock of Judah is ticked backwards and everything continues as it was. Think Jeremiah, think early ministry, of Daniel and Ezekiel. But Habakkuk doesn't show up in the narrative at all around this time. He's just, quote, the prophet. That's all we have of him. His book is not about him. It's not about the man. It's about the message. So what is this message of Habakkuk? Well, Habakkuk is a unique book in that the whole thing that we have here, these three chapters, is just a prayer. That's it. It's just a prayer between him and God. He presents a complaint, and God responds. He presents a second complaint, and God responds. And then he closes with a song. That's it. It's a prayer, a dialogue. Let's zoom in a little bit to the beginning of Habakkuk's prayer, back in chapter 2, back in chapter 1, verse 2. Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at the wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. There's Habakkuk's opening prayer, his first complaint. And notice, this is not just some whimsical remark. This is something he's been praying about for a long while. O oh Lord, how long will I cry to you, and you do not hear, you do not answer, you don't save. How long, Lord? Are you ever burdened, beloved? You put those burdens before God, but nothing. When it feels as though you've been left out to dry, that God is far off, that's how Habakkuk feels. And did you catch who his complaint is about? His complaint is about God's own people, the ones who'd been given the law, the ones who had been called to justice on the basis of that law, the ones whom God said He would discipline if they turned from Him and faithfully bring them back to Himself. But what does Habakkuk see? Lawlessness, injustice, destruction and violence, fights, and conflicts in God's people. Does any of that characterize God's people today? Is there any of that that's seen at home church today? And are you ever burdened by these things in your midst, in this valley? In eastern Zambia, There was a man who was a witch doctor, and he had met his wife, who was also a witch doctor. They were practicing charms and spells, worshiping the spirits, and they found one another, and it seemed like a great party to be able to do this together, to worship, to come together, to throw all these spells, to see things happen. They'd reached such a level in witchcraft that they would even meet with these witches and 
make them flee from their presence by the different spells that they had cast. What happened with this guy? What happened with his wife? They joined a church. He became a deacon for four years, an elder for eight years, while he was practicing witchcraft as a witch doctor. Twelve years leadership in the church there in eastern Zambia. And he would hear these other pastors calling people to throw away your charms, do away with all of these trinkets, bones and charms and amulets. And he thought, absolutely impossible. He couldn't imagine a life that was given to people that they would be able to be secure without these charms, that they would be able to be whole and healthy and well without casting these spells. And so he would coach people in this. After and outside of church, he would tell people, no, this is really the way that we must appease the spirits and the gods. This is how we can make things happen. In terrible ways, bringing women over, doing indecent things to them, to say it lightly, and saying that that would make this spell more powerful. This was within the church. He would help these women carry out abortions. And it was only later that God finally turned his heart around and his wife by God's grace. But it wasn't foreign from the church. And that may seem outlandish, but it isn't a rare thing to find witchcraft in the church, even within leadership. It's all over in Africa. Yes, but that's just in Africa. It may be closer here than you realize. There's witchcraft that happens out in Santa Cruz Mountains. And it comes into the valley as well. In San Francisco, there's some friends there who've spent time every week outside one of the planned parenthoods down in San Francisco. Counseling pregnant girls that come by. Offering them the help that's available to them to help care for their child. Instead of thinking that ending its life is the only solution, let alone any solution at all. And they've been confronted multiple times out there on the streets by people who identify as witches, furious at the work that they're doing there. But you know some of the most vocal opponents to the sidewalk counseling outside of these abortion clinics? Christians. I've seen it firsthand at two different locations here in southern San Jose. In fact, around half of the people who go into Planned Parenthood are either from Christian or Catholic backgrounds. That's in the church. What's going on? Do you ever see this? Lawlessness, injustice, destruction, violence, fights, conflicts whatever it may be, in our midst, do you ever cry out to God on behalf of the wickedness that surrounds His people? Beloved, it wouldn't be unique to you. Our Father knows your burdens. He cares for you. And He hasn't left us without an answer. Look at His response to Habakkuk, verse 5. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Here comes the response. What is it? What is this that I cannot believe, that I couldn't understand? It's incredible. It's getting good. In fact, this is sometimes among people's favorite verses. And it is incredible. But we must just understand why it's incredible. What does God mean by this? He continues, verse 6. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation. And then the rest of what God says is just a description in length about how terrifying they are. They pillage and plunder other people's things, and they do so with fury. They wipe out everything that's in their path. They're as quick as leopards, as fierce as wolves, as accurate as an eagle after its prey. They have no regard for authority. They're a law unto themselves, guilty men who are a god unto themselves. So ends 
God's response. That's the solution. That's the answer. Prayer answered. Nothing else said there except a proclamation of justice by the hand of a ruthless tyrant. And his judgments are good. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? He is good in his judgments. And that God shows mercy to whom he will show mercy and compassion to whom he wills. But may that never be a license for us to carry on in our sin. A license to sin. Exhibit A, Judah. What would you be thinking right now? What was Habakkuk thinking? Well, we get his response. We don't have to wonder. Verse 12, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. Amen. Habakkuk remembers God's covenant with his people. He remembers that God said that his people will not be wiped out. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. But notice now a turn in his tone. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors? Who's he talking about now? And remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man who's more righteous than he. And then Habakkuk gives this. This poem about Babylon's wickedness with all sorts of fishing imagery. And he waits for God's next response. Do you catch that? Someone who's more righteous than he. Oh, interesting, Habakkuk. So God can bring judgment against his people when they sin. He's good in that. So long as it's not with a spanking rod that someone who's more wicked than them is holding. You can use fire from heaven, God. You could let the earth open up and swallow people. But you can't use someone who we are more righteous than, God. What do you say to that? God responds. Chapter 2. And the Lord answered me. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. So that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And here's the vision. Here's the message that he's supposed to run out throughout the nations and proclare. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It's not right within him. I.e., I see Babylon's wickedness, Habakkuk. But, but, the righteous shall live by faith. There's the centerpiece of his reply, and it's glorious. And then verse 5 is effectively a summary of the rest of the chapter about Babylon's sin. We'll just dip into that part, and then we'll come back to chew on this nugget here in verse 4. Verses 6 to 8. Those who steal and even violently rack up unpaid debt will have it taken from them. 9 to 11. Those who seek to secure themselves out of reach, they'll have their very rafters and walls crying testimony against them. Verse 12 to 14. Those who build a name for themselves at the expense of others will find that all of their name is just smothered by the glory of another. And that's, by the way, where we get that famous verse, 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, not Babylon, not Judah, not China or America or the EU, but the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's all of it, by the way. Verse 15 to 17, those who pour out drink for others so that they can look at them naked, they will themselves drink a cup of shame and a cup of God's wrath. 
Verse 18 to 20, those who make speechless idols to worship will themselves be speechless in the presence of the living God. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. In one of the villages that we were at, we got to spend several hours just discussing the things that God mentions here in this section and asking, is this true of my life? Is this true of our community? What else must be addressed in our lives as we follow God? And every one of these things came up here that's described of Babylon, that's described of the wicked, the more wicked. Theft, debt, pride at others' expenses, trickery, vain securities, drunkenness, sexual sin, idolatry, and actual carved idols. You might go through the list Make a nice little checklist for yourself. Well, I didn't do that, and that's not really a big one for me. Well, they've done that one way worse than I have. At least I'm more righteous than that one. And we'd be falling into the very same temptation that Habakkuk did. You see that? Yes, Habakkuk, his soul is puffed up. I see that. It's not right with him. But the righteous one is not righteous because he's better than them. The righteous will live by his faith. It's not getting a better report card. Who cares about that? As Shakespeare put it, comparisons are odorous. It's the fact that we've sinned at all, that we have any sin in us. And an understanding of God's righteous justice that finally drove Habakkuk in the end to wait patiently for the Lord in faith. A patient, hopeful, waiting for God to work. You know in chapter 2, those verses 3 and 4, that nugget, that's quoted on three separate occasions in the New Testament. And each with a slightly different focus. But every time pertaining to these ideas of righteousness and faith. In Galatians 1, Paul quotes it, not The law that brings justice, that brings righteousness. It's faith that makes us righteous. If it was the law that would make us righteous, well, Judah's guilty, you and I are guilty. That wouldn't do it. We can't be made righteous. No one. But Abram was righteous. That was before the law. Romans 1. This righteousness isn't just for the Jews. It's for the Jews and Gentiles, for all who believe. You mean even if people from Babylon believed, trusted in God, waited on Him, they would be saved? You bet. And Hebrews 10, the timing of it, wait for it in faith. He that is coming, even if it seems slow, will come and will not delay, waiting patiently for something as not yet seen. But where does that leave us? If we zoom right back out again to the big picture here. Habakkuk complains to God. Why aren't you doing anything about your people's sin? God responds, oh Habakkuk, patience. I am doing something. I'm using Babylon to judge them. Habakkuk's second prayer. Whoa, Babylon? They're way, way, way worse. What about their sin? What are you doing with that? And God, Habakkuk, I do see their sin. They will be judged too, but you aren't made righteous by being better than them. The righteous shall live by his faith. Where did all of that leave Habakkuk? Remember what we opened our time with? Habakkuk was shivering in his boots. Quite simply, A proper understanding of the righteous judgment of God leaves us in fear. Literally, shaking. That's what fear means, to be shaking, trembling. And so we get this response then from Habakkuk in chapter 3. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to the Shigeonith. He writes a song. 
O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Strange ideas to put side by side, aren't they? In wrath, remember mercy. And his mind wanders back to the end of Moses' life. To that last song that Moses sung, the end of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. The song that Moses sung of God's deliverance of his people. He sings about his nurture, his care, how he fed them and guided them, how he instructed his people. He gave them only what was good for them, the very best. And what did they do? They spat in his face again and again and again. So how did God respond? He brings judgment as he said he would. God hands them over to their enemies. Enemies who make fun of God. How weak God is. But how does this song of Moses end? God says about those nations that mock him, vengeance is mine and recompense for the day their foot shall slip. For the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. That is to say, in other words, as Edward described it in this passage, Those nations who rebel against God are sinners in the hands of an angry God. And the final chorus of Moses' song, how does it end? Rejoice with Him, O heavens. Where does that come from? Because God has taken justice over His enemies. Rejoice with Him, O heavens. Bow down to Him, all gods. For he He avenges the blood of His children. He takes vengeance on his adversaries and he repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. He cares for his children. He will not let them go. And with that, the curtain to Moses' song falls. With a call to rejoicing. This song of Moses was surely on Habakkuk's mind. Because Habakkuk goes on to quote from the portion just after it. And Habakkuk too summarizes God's faithful hand to work salvation for his people. And as he nears the end of his song, here in Habakkuk 3, he says these words, verse 16, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones and my legs tremble beneath me. He's in fear. But was that a fear that drove him away from God? No. No, this was the right kind of fear. The fear that you and I must have in the presence of God. Trembling before him. The kind of fear that in trembling, recognizing how great he is, it draws us toward God. Because that one who is so great, that one who avenges his enemies, that one who protects his children, is our God. Is our Father. It draws us into his arms. To wait for him. To hope in him. The God who is so great is his God. No one could dare take him off the throne. Yet I will wait quietly for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. I'll wait. God had done it before. He would do it again. Wait for it. It will surely come. Remember God's reply? It would have to be God. His work. In His way. But how and when, how and when would God's wrath be satisfied against his enemies so that in wrath God would remember mercy? How could that be? Isn't that what we celebrated last week on Good Friday? That in wrath 
God remembered mercy. As His wrath was poured out on His beloved Son. It was the only way. And may we who have been given that vision run with it and declare that to the nations. He has shown us mercy in Christ. We must run to Him. What burdens you this morning, dear Christian? What wears heavy on your heart? Have you remembered who sits on the throne? The risen Lamb who died, who is alive, who is seated at the right hand of the Father? Leave your sin on His shoulders daily. Find your righteousness not in your report card. Find your righteousness in Him. He will come again to take His bride home. He will. With eternal judgment for His enemies. And He won't delay in that. Even if He seems slow, wait for Him. Rejoice in Him. Oh, how beautiful that threefold repetition is on the last pages of our Bible. Surely I am coming quickly. I'm coming again. If it seems slow, wait for it. It won't delay. And rejoice in Him. How did Moses' song end? Rejoice, O you heavens. Bow down, O you gods. Habakkuk's just putting it to practice here at the end of his song. Let's close with this. Verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Father, We have such a small picture of you. Forgive us for our stubbornness in sin. Return us to you. Grow our love more and more for yourself, Father. To hope in you, the God of our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.